Hello and welcome to the 2020 Western Horn Festival online edition. This session, Meet the Performers, features members of the Cobalt Quartet, Katie Johnson-Webb, Caroline Steiger, Rose Valby, and myself. Since its founding in 2017, Cobalt Quartet has given performances and masterclasses across the United States. Through their performances and masterclasses, the Cobalt Quartet is dedicated to engaging, educating, and entertaining audiences of all ages and backgrounds. In August 2018, Cobalt Quartet won the professional division of the International Horn Society's Horn Quartet Competition. Members of the ensemble hold positions at Western Illinois University, Texas State University, the University of Tennessee Knoxville, and the United States Air Force Band of the West. Okay, so good morning, everyone. This is the interview with members of the Cobalt Quartet as part of the 2020 Western Horn Festival digital version. So um, I'd like us to go around and do some introductions, just who we are, what we do um, on, in, our, in our daily lives. So um, Katie, why don't you start? Okay, I'm Katie Johnson. I'm the Horn Professor at the University of Tennessee. And I've been teaching here uh, in Knoxville for seven years. So um, yeah, I, have a, I teach my horn studio, I teach brass pedagogy, I play in the faculty quintet, and I get to do really great things. I play with this group of ladies, so it's a pretty good, pretty good career. Awesome. Caroline. Hi, I'm Caroline Steiger. I teach horn at the um, Texas State University in San Marcos, and um, this is my fourth year there. And same as Katie, I play and I teach and I get to work with Cobalt, which I love. Excellent. And Rose? I am Rose Falby and I'm a member of the United States Air Force Band of the West in San Antonio, Texas. Before the Air Force, I was a teacher and freelancer in Austin, Texas. Excellent. And I am Jenna Gardner. I teach at Western Illinois University. I'm in my second year teaching there. And in addition to teaching, I play in faculty woodwind and brass quintets and play in cobalt. So um, the next question for everyone is, what age did you begin playing the horn? And do you remember why you picked the horn? Uh, let's just go in the same order. That's the easiest thing to do. So actually I had a student interviewing me for a project yesterday. I had to think about this. Same question. So I started playing the horn in um, fourth grade. I don't know what age you are in fourth grade, but about 12. 10, 11, something like that. Yep. Um, and I don't know. I just always knew we had a family friend who played horn. And so I thought it was cool. And it was just like, that's what I'm going to play. <laughs> I was little. So I don't know. It was just like no other option. <laughs> well, it worked out. It worked out. Yes. You know. Yes. Um, I started in fifth grade and, uh, they, I had seen a brass quintet, um, play at my school the year before. Um, and so I really liked the horn and I asked to try the horn when they were doing instrument, instrument tryouts. Um, and they said, okay. And they were like, wouldn't, I remember they wouldn't let me hold it. They, they held it. And I was like, no, I know how to do this. <laughs> And I said, okay, well, you make a sound like this. And then I made a sound and they're like, oh, okay, you're actually pretty good. So you can play the horn. Um, <laughs> I, I, I technically started out on percussion. Oh. Um, yeah. And then, and then the band director was like, no, you need to be playing the horn. So <laughs> your talents are wasted. <laughs> I don't think there were any. I had a similar experience. Go ahead, Rose. <laughs> Uh, well, my mom uh, was a band director, she still is, and she knew that I had a good ear, and as a band director, you know that you can't waste that, so she's like, oh, she should be a horn player, and I just thought it looked really cool, and at the time, her boyfriend was a trumpet player, and so, um, and also a band director, so they could look at my face, and they could sort of see, okay, I think she would be a good fit, and plus, it just looked so cool, and... <laughs> It worked out and they they had me start in third grade a year early earlier than you would normally start in new york state but worked out mm -hmm. that's neat that's actually very similar i mean i started on the violin when i was 
five doing Same. Suzuki violin. Yeah. And also in third grade, my band director parents decided that they thought I should play the horn because of a good ear from violin. I, of course, did not want to play the horn. I thought, oh, I want to play the clarinet. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> um, so, you know, you go to first day band class and you fill out the thing and this is what instrument I want to play. And, you know, I put clarinet and I get a horn back. <laughs> That's ironic. <laughs> because my parents told the band teacher. Um, and I ended up really liking it, but I, I quit playing after a year because it was like a conflict at school with the musical or something that I wanted to be in, you know, fourth grade, big life choices. And I ended up coming back to it in sixth grade because I really missed it. Um, I think I had discovered the sound and like, I thought the instrument looked cool and all that stuff. So it was kind of fun. And eventually I quit violin. I don't know about you, Rose. Did Same. You keep Piano and violin, they just couldn't compete with the horn. <laughs> it's ironic that you put down horn and were sent home with Claire and you know, you, yeah, you put down clarinet and we're sent home with horn because I put down horn and they sent me home with a clarinet original. Oh. <laughs> we don't even have a horn for you to try. So my parents had to call like every music store in our area to find a horn. It was wow. Well, it's great that they did that for you yeah. though. I mean, that's I, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I want to ask everyone, you know, was there like a moment or an experience that you can remember where you decided that, you know, you just had to pursue a career on this instrument, you know, that moment of insanity or something. <laughs> I don't know if I had like a moment that I can recall. It was just sort of like a gradual thing. And for uh -huh. me, it was more like, I felt like I had to teach it. I don't know that I had a moment where it was like, I have to be in an orchestra or I have to do, it was mm. just like a gradual development of like, I really need to teach this thing. Because so they went together for you, both the teaching and playing the horn. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. I would say it was just a lot of little, I mean, big, big things, but a lot of little moments through time. Like I started taking lessons when I was a freshman in high school um, with a member of the Detroit Symphony and I started going to hear the symphony more um, and then I think it was uh, maybe my my junior year that I started doing youth ensembles youth orchestras so it's just a lot of little things where like through time you know and and getting all of those experiences and just being like filled with the sound of professional musician mm -hmm. I was like you know I think I really want to do this and so um talk to my teacher at the end of end of my junior year about looking at schools. I did this summer trip three years in a row with my mom. It was this 50-person um, band, 50-person choir, and they were mostly high school students. And I was still in middle school. I was in seventh and eighth grade, like the first two times I went on this trip. And we toured in Europe for two weeks. And that was wow. such a formative experience. And I remember one concert, it was our final concert of the first tour I ever did when we were sitting um, on stage in this you know, little outdoor Austrian concert venue with the Alps right next to us. And we played selections from The Sound of Music. And <laughs> it was just, I was like bawling my eyes out at the end of this concert knowing that I wouldn't ever be with these people again. And for me, that was like the moment when I was like, wow, music is so powerful. Um, and it took a few years for me in high school to finally be like, okay, I want to do this. I signed up for choir. I did Greater Buffalo Youth Orchestra. I mean, I had been in lessons this whole time, but I was like, okay, I'm going to do this now. So, but really just that, like that experience as a young child, being connected with musicians and people. And that was the moment. That's cool. I think for me, it started um, pretty young too. I was, I went to Interlochen in the summer when I was in like eighth grade and I was playing violin and horn at the same time, but I only had two pieces ready to go on horn because, you know, I mean, preparing a piece on violin was a much longer term project at that point in life. So I auditioned on horn and ended up in the orchestra program there playing horn and I had 
never had my own part before. I mean, it was like glorious, you know, because as a violinist, you've got 12 other violin players and in band, all the saxophones and trombone players were always messing up my parts. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like so cool to get to play in, and they did real, real orchestral rep in the like junior high group there because it was such a, a good group. And, um, Actually, I, Dr. Faust, who is my predecessor at Western, was the coach when I was in that orchestra as a middle schooler. Wow. Full um, circle. I know. It's pretty funny. So, and I just remember being so thrilled with like what that was like. And um, I don't know if I decided in that moment, but I remember it being a moment where I was like, this could be something that I would really love. And then uh, later, the teaching part came in, like you, Katie, um, mm -hmm. that, that I felt where that's where my creative talents were, were best used. Um, so let's get into talking about like our education and career path. Um, I know all of us have doctorates, um, but we probably had different ways of getting there. And um, I think it might be interesting for students who are thinking about careers in music to understand all the different facets that careers can go through, um, especially on the, in the beginning end of it, where you're kind of finding your place in the world. Yeah. Um, so I actually started, again, I was kind of like a sort of came to me, this career path came to me a little later. I actually started as a political science major in undergrad, and I was pretty sure I was going to go to law school and, um, but it was about a year into that program that my, I was taking like elective lessons. It was just something, it was just kind of like I'd always done it. So why not do it here? And my teacher was like, you're playing in the orchestra, you play in the band, you're taking lessons. Like you might as well just get a minor in music. And I thought, well, I mean, the difference between a minor and a major, I sort of looked at the programs, it wasn't that much. So I thought, eh, I'll just add a music major. So I did that. Um, finish them. And then I took a year off because I knew at that time, I knew that I wanted to pursue, pursue music, but I really was not ready to go to graduate school. So I took a year off and I took lessons and studied Alexander technique and um, played in a summer orchestra with Jenna, <laughs> which is how we met. And I was just sort of like trying to figure out what am I going to do with this. And um, then I then I went into graduate school and all kind of got serious, which is where I met Rose um, at the University of Wisconsin. So that that was sort of the time in my life that the path was kind of um, made more clear. And what, as soon as I finished, it was almost done with my master's degree, I decided like I, I by that time I knew I wanted to teach. And so the next step was a DMA. And so I just continued to finish that degree. I, um... I started as a performance major at the University of Michigan. Um, and within, by the end of my first year there, I, when I went in, I was like, I'm not gonna have a backup plan. Like, I'm gonna take a bunch of auditions and I just have to go full force because I didn't know any better. And so by the end of the first year, I just felt like my whole life revolved around sitting in a practice room and you know, going to classes and all of that was fine, but I was practicing like three and four hours a day and just not, not really feeling the joy of it. Um, and my parents are both teachers and, you know, I talked with them and, and they were like, you know, I know you don't want a backup plan, but maybe you would enjoy adding an education component to your degree. And so I, I went and talked to my advisor and, and we all agreed that it was a good idea. So um, I added a music education uh, certification to my degree and added a year <laughs> onto, my, onto my degree, which was fine. Um, and I loved it. And I really, really thought I wanted to be a, a, an elementary general music teacher for a very long time. Um, and uh, probably still would have gone that route. But I, when I went and student taught, I just kind of missed um, playing. And, and like the most fun parts of my day were when I got to like stay after school and, and teach lessons. 
um, either small group lessons or individual lessons to students on any instrument. And I just thought, maybe, maybe I'm better suited in this teaching environment than, you know, 30 and 40 and 50 plus kids <laughs> at a time. Maybe I'm, I'm much better as a private teacher. Um, so I uh, changed my plans and auditioned for grad schools. Um, I went to Penn State uh, for my master's and, and um, got a really great teaching assistantship there. So I taught a lot of lessons um, and, and courses and got a lot of really great experience um, working there. And uh, I, I really didn't want to get a doctorate. I think at that point, I still, I still really wanted to be taking auditions. Um, and so when I, when I applied for more graduate programs after that, like the only school that I applied for, for the doctorate program was Michigan. And that was because, um, Adam Unsworth told me to, <laughs> um, I, everywhere else I was looking at like an artist diploma or second master's degree or something like that, because I just didn't really feel like I was ready for the doctorate. I wanted to have some experience. I wanted to have um, you know, some, some more playing and teaching that I could rely on and to figure things out. Um, and it just ended up working out. You know, I got, I got a really great assistantship from, from Michigan and I felt really comfortable after talking with Adam, um, that that was, that was a good place for me to be. And, and I ended up getting really great experience through that. I, um, got to teach for a semester at SUNY Potsdam, um, Crane School of Music as a sabbatical replacement. Um, and that was, that was really great. And I don't think I would have had that opportunity. Oh, I wouldn't have had that opportunity had I not gone to Michigan for my doctorate. So I'm really glad that I made those choices. Well, um, early on for me in my collegiate schooling, it was pretty straightforward. I did my undergraduate degree in music performance. I knew that I didn't want to be a band director like my mom. I just I really liked teaching or the idea of teaching, but I just knew that in a band setting, not for me. So I did performance and then I went on to do grad school at Wisconsin where I met Katie. And um, Katie was a big inspiration to me and I knew that she was kind of on this path um, to university teaching and mm -hmm. I got really fired up about that. Um, and I did a little bit of teaching in, you know, when I was younger and in grad school and stuff like that. Um, but then I was like, okay, I think I'd like to you know, teach at a college someday, but I wasn't quite ready for my doctorate yet. So I moved to Austin, Texas, and I realized that I had a lot of friends there from my undergrad um, back in New York State who were teaching at these amazing band programs in Texas. And Texas band is just wild. Didn't grow up in this program at all, um, but it was very cool to be a part of it later on in life. So I taught a million students and did a lot of freelancing there. Um, and then I decided that it made sense to stay there to do my doctorate because I was already set up professionally in a lot of ways. Plus I had the teaching experience um, or the opportunity to teach a lot. Um, so I stayed in Austin and studied at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, it was kind of during that degree where I was like, oh, maybe, maybe college teaching, it just, it didn't feel like the right thing for me to move forward. Um, and I saw, you know, I saw the path that a lot of my friends were taking where they were moving around a lot and um, they, they weren't loving their jobs at small schools. And that's, you know, we have these, these steps we have to take in any, any music path. Um, but that just didn't seem like the right thing for me. So I decided staying put in Austin um, and being just a part of that um, amazing mu music education culture was the best place for me. And I did my doctorate all during that, so. Can you, um, Rose, talk about at, after your doctorate and your, your job now? Yeah, so um, I'm of course in a military band now and that's something I, never thought I would be a part of. Um, I just didn't consider myself a military type person at all. Um, and I, so I mentioned that I was a freelancer as well. And one of my good friends from my doctorate won a swap playing bassoon in the Air Force Band. 
and they needed another horn player for one of their tours. So I was able to go on tour with the Band of the West, the band that I'm in now, um, for a week. I was able to do the job for a week and that really opened my eyes. Wow, these are totally normal people and um, it's a great environment to be a part of. And it's all the best things about music, going and connecting with people. And um, I really enjoyed that. So at the end of that week, I got the piece of paper that said, I have a job in the United States Air Force Regional Bands, if I would like that. And um, I decided to pursue that. So um, I, the opportunity fell into my lap and I'm really thankful it did. So. Okay. So I'm curious as just sort of a follow-up. Um, oh, I guess I didn't talk about me. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so I started out at um, Northwestern University for undergrad as a dual degree major, also in political science and horn. And I got about halfway through Northwestern's on the quarter system so I got through the winter, winter quarter and I was taking these political science classes and I was like why am I doing this <laughs> you know like I'm just loving horn lessons and studying with Gail and playing in ensembles and like why am I um, not going full throttle for the thing that I really care about um, so I did that and um, in my senior year I got into civic orchestra so I decided to stay after I graduated and play the second year um, while I was in civic and that was a little bit of a learning experience of what it's like to be out of school and play the horn and work part-time job at borders which still existed at the time and um, I think I thought, saw it as like I was testing myself, like would I really practice and do the things I needed to do when I didn't have a teacher? And um, at the end of that, I decided I wanted to go ahead and pursue masters. So I ended up in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon um, where Bill Cavallaro was my teacher. Um, but I will say that more than that, the Pittsburgh Symphony was my teacher. I got a job as an usher um, and I was there ushering three or four nights a week for like $7 an hour. And I learned so much from hearing that orchestra play. Um, that was just an amazing thing. And that's where I started freelancing a lot and taking auditions. And at that point, I really thought, certainly I'd always thought really at that point, it was all about the orchestral career and you know, getting a job in a full-time orchestra. Um, so I did end up getting a full-time orchestra job for two seasons with Louisiana Philharmonic. I was a temporary um, full, full season sub on the second horn and then on fourth horn. And I learned so much from that experience about what is it like to be a full-time orchestra musician. And I discovered that I just wasn't loving it like I thought, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the right thing for me, kind of what you were saying, Rose, about university teaching. Um, I just felt that I didn't get to be very creative and I wasn't very motivated um, and it was becoming like a job and um, that's when I decided to go after a doctorate and pursue teaching which I felt very much more creative and passionate about so then I ended up back at Northwestern doing the doctorate there and now I'm on my second college teaching job I taught in Arkansas for a year and now back in Illinois so um, my follow-up question to, to this was to ask, what things do you feel like were missing from your formal education that you had to really go after or um, discover for yourself? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, you know, there, I was talking to this a student of mine yesterday about this um, you know, when you're in a traditional school program, you take a lot. This is an interesting time for our students who are all learning um, remotely for the mm -hmm. first time. You get a lot of motivation and organization and structure from your teachers and your colleagues and your ensembles. And you don't necessarily find many opportunities, even in the summer, if you're going to summer festivals, the structure's built in. Um, so when I kind of, I took a year off in between my undergraduate and graduate work, but the structure was there because I was 
working with a teacher every week on Horn and Alexander, and I was working a job. So like my time was very full. Um, when I graduated and finished my doctorate, I had a year where I was applying for jobs and I didn't have a full-time position anywhere. I was just freelancing a little bit and applying for jobs. And it wasn't, um, I was very motivated to get a job, but there was no, you know, I didn't give a recital. I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have a big studio because I didn't really intend to be in that place for very long. Um, and so when I got my job in Tennessee, it was like, okay, now I'm settled in a place and I have to sort of design partially for the job, but also for the like career and advancement of my own ability. I really have to design a structure for myself where I have goals and the freedom to do the things that I want to do. Like I recorded the CD and I get to give the recitals, you know, with repertoire that I choose. I think, I think the designing structure, my formal education was so structured that I, I didn't really get an opportunity to design my own structure. And that um, I, I've been thinking a lot about that the last two weeks, particularly because for the first time, I think my students are getting to do that at a much younger age than I did. I mean, there's actually a, a positive to this whole situation we're finding ourselves in, but um, it's sort of like a long-term uh, project to keep yourself going in a career when, you know, I, I sub a lot with orchestras, but I don't have a regular orchestral position. So, um, you know, all the projects, playing projects that I do are generally self-motivated and self-structured. So that, that's been an interesting thing that I, I didn't think, I didn't really have in school. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm having a hard time with this one because I feel like, I feel like all of my programs were really um, uniquely designed to give me, to give me what I needed and if, if they didn't, I knew where to go to get what I needed. I knew how to structure my, my program to get what I needed. Um, you know, like I had four different private, private lessons teachers in the first three years of um, my undergrad because the teacher my first year um, left and we had two teachers the next year, well, three teachers the next year and then Adam Unsworth got hired. So uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, if anything is gonna get done, it's on me to get it done. And I have to be um, prepared and I have to build, build structure and I have to know how to practice and I have to kind of say like, I need to work on this. Um, and in my music education courses, we talked a lot about um, scaffolding in, in lessons and how to practice and how to teach your students how to practice and um, how, to, how to motivate and and uh, in my master's degree um, I felt like I was really really well prepared for going out into the world because I had some opportunities to freelance I had some opportunities to teach and also Lisa Bontrager um, who's the home professor at Penn State, she, um, you know, she had a freelance career before she started teaching. And she talked about how she got her private studio and she helped me kind of develop some of those materials. Um, and was a really good mentor for me as I was moving on to my next step. And then um, in my doctorate, we had a lot of courses that and, and mentors that helped us prepare our materials and helped us, you know, write write a syllabus. And, you know, I just felt like in every in every aspect of my preparation and my school preparation, I felt like I had enough tools to, to move forward. I would say, you know, no formal education is going to prepare you fully as you move forward. Um, like Katie said, you're, you're going to have to figure out how to structure your time. No one's going to sit down and say, you practice now, and then you practice now, and then you do this, and then you take a break. Um, and you really have to figure that out, and you have to be disciplined. And, and it's also never going to really fully prepare you for how to, how to motivate yourself um, and how to, how to continue to, to fuel your artistic passions um, and just, you know, maintain that drive and perseverance. Because no matter what, I mean, this is, these are really crazy times, 
um, and we're all experiencing that, but they're, we're going to get out of school. People are going to get out of school and, and have to persevere through something. And so no formal education is really truly going to prepare you for that. And that's just, you know, you, you have to kind of be prepared um, ahead of time that you're going to have to figure some of those things out on your own. Um, and that's when I teach my students, I really, and I tell them this, you know, my job is to prepare you to be your own teacher. So we'll talk more in lessons as they get, um, as, as they move into their upper levels about how they would maybe teach that aspect of, of a solo or an etude. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll just, we'll just talk more about the process of teaching and, and the process of explaining things. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's my answer to that. I'll try and be quick because I know we're running short on time. Um, it took me a little while to figure out what type of learner I was and what I needed. Um, and my undergraduate teacher was vastly different than my high school teacher. My high school teacher was quite organized. He would say, play this etude or learn this etude, learn this part of the solo, come in, have that prepared. And so I was just mindless in my, you know, my preparation in a good way where I would just, I would do everything he asked. And then I got to my undergraduate teacher and it, that was not the case. Lessons were very sort of wishy-washy and, oh, what are you going to play today? And um, so I think just learning what type of perform or what type of learner you are and um, if you need that structure um, and no one's providing it for you, you have to create it for yourself, like, especially just playing wise. Um, in terms of my regular life, I was quite structured, um, but just in individual practice time and all of that, I needed to be my own uh, person for that. And it took me a little while to learn that. Um, also, I love that Caroline School had, uh, you sounded like you had really, really wonderful classes preparing you for the basic things like cover letters and writing a syllabus and CVs and all of that. So I've feel like that was missing from my formal education a bit. Um, there were always resources for it, but they weren't horn specific or they weren't, they were more general. So I think it's really great that you have that. So those are kind of the things I feel like I missed. Yeah, uh, I hear everything that you're saying, all of you, I think are generally talking about how important it is to be self-directed with whatever you want to be doing. Um, I remember I had an, I had a moment, um, where I was actually kind of angry. I was out of school and I felt like I, I wasn't in, I wasn't in the career. I didn't have a full-time orchestra job. And, and yet that's what my degree path had prepared me for. And, um, I got over that and I started figuring out like, what, what do I need to teach myself? Mm -hmm. And um, some of those skills were, you know, figuring out how to get work as a freelancer. Who do I talk to? What, what does my resume need to look like? You know, there's a little bit of that, especially in a, um, undergrad, but I, but ma mainly I felt like undergrad, I was playing recitals and I was doing mock auditions and learning how to audition for an orchestra, but I wasn't learning about all the other options that we have. Um, to be music professionals outside of the orchestral world. So I learned a lot about that and um, a lot on my own and a lot just on the job. You know, you get one freelance job, you figure out how it works, you ask this person, you ask that person. Um, so I think my, my advice to students would be like, ask people who are doing something that you wanna be doing how they got there, you know? And um, I think I hear from a lot of students, uh, oh, I wanna be, a university professor, so I'm going to go get a doctorate. And I don't think it's that simple, right? Um, all of us have talked about other experiences we had along the way, other um, professional performing opportunities, and that we continue to do um, as freelancers and also through our ensemble and cobalt. Um, I just think it's so important that people recognize what you said, Caroline, where there no education is going to get teach you everything but also that there are so many career options that um, you're gonna have to kind of figure out different things about different ones and find where you land. But um, it's not the same world that maybe it was for some of our teachers. Uh, I know certainly my teachers, they, ha they had full-time orchestral jobs and um, 
that was always going to be available to them. Um, the world we live in now is not quite as, um, I don't know what the word is, but you all know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Statistically speaking. So, um, okay. So we're running out of time here. So I want to take a moment to thank you all for sharing a little bit about your lives. We could probably do this all day. I feel like I learned so much more about my <laughs> colleagues, which is really awesome. Um, just as a last second thing, if it doesn't cut us off, let's, um, what's on your music stand right now as you are practicing in the COVID-19 times? Unmeasured preludes right here next to me. Awesome. Caroline? I've got the Jeff Agrell rhythm coprosh arrangements, cool. which are fun. Rose? I have the uh, canonic sonatas that I've been playing with uh, Justice, who's a tuba player. So we've actually been reading cello duets and all sorts of things that make my brain hurt. Is that Telemann canonic sonatas? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, I've got my Chantal and I've got Maxime Alphonse book three. I'm just like focusing on some, some basics because we have the time. Isn't that nice? That's what I told my students. When do you ever get as much time as you want to practice whatever you need to work on right now, you know, like so many scale patterns. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for watching. Our next session will begin at 11 a.m. Central Time with instrument repair specialist, Mr. Chad Walker. Grab your valve oil and slide grease and we'll see you soon. The 2020 Western Horn Festival is offered free to the public. If you would like to make a donation to support students facing unexpected hardship due to COVID-19, text WIUCARE to the number 41444.